A portion of today's video is sponsored by Fractal Design. I don't think the Sony Endzone M9 monitor is even stocked yet, but this 27 inch 4K 144 hertz monitor packs 96 zones of full local area dimming and HDR 600 support that's already seen LG making some aggressive price cuts in response. The Sony M9 aims to be a one size fit for both PC and console players, especially PS5, where it shares a lot of that same aesthetic design language. I should point out right at the top that it makes an excellent companion for the Series X as well, but you do get some quality of life features on the PS5 side like auto config that we'll talk about a little bit later. The stand here is unique in that it doesn't take up a lot of forward space on the desk. It's a great design if you like to have a lot of usable real estate under your monitor without using an arm. It even allows for some really sweaty positioning too as you can get your mouse pad and your angled keyboard way under this thing. The downside is that there's no swivel and there's no pivot. You only get tilt and height adjust. It's pretty limited in height as well, especially for taller people. Luckily, you can vase them out this if you want. When it comes to plugging devices, it's honestly just easier to prop it up on its side. It is a pain that some of the ports are right in front of the stand. There is a cable management channel through this stand that looks pretty clean if you only have a single device hooked up, but it gets pretty crowded pretty fast if you have multiple devices. On the rear of the panel, you do have some RGB that's pretty low key. It's not enough to throw light at the wall or anything, but it's also not enough to look corny or gamery. Controls are very minimal with just a power button and a control joystick, which we'll talk about in just a sec. The power LED is on the side. There's just over a millimeter of actual plastic bezel on the sides, but there's an additional six millimeters of dead space on the panel before you get to the image. About five millimeters of this on the top and two millimeters on the bottom edge. Overall, it's a super clean mono look and a no brainer aesthetic if you have your PS5 close by. One thing I got to point out that was super weird is that this is the first monitor I've ever unboxed that didn't have any cables inside. That's fine if you've got a PS5 and you already have your HDMI cable, but if you're a PC user, this is your first monitor. That's a real pain to have to go locate cables. Bare minimum, there should be a display port cable included in this. You get a very respectable amount of connections here. You get headphone output, three USB type A, one USB type B, one USB-C that doubles as a Thunderbolt, one DisplayPort 1.4, and two HDMI 2.1. So your consoles are gonna run wide open, 4K 120 with G-Sync as the variable refresh rate. There's also KBM switching built into this monitor. With that USB-C, you can plug in your laptop and use the same set of peripherals to control both. That's great for productivity scenarios. While I didn't perceive any latency using my mouse and keyboard like this, it's really hard for me to imagine that it's not adding to the end-to-end -end latency there for gaming performance. So if you're gonna be on competitive FPS or rhythm games, I would still connect my peripherals directly to the PC. There are speakers in here as well, which I thought I would at least mention, but they're monitor speakers, they'll do in a pinch, but I would recommend literally any other audio solution. One of my favorite things on this monitor that I wish I saw more frequently is their Endzone Hub software. It's the same one you use for their headsets, but it also controls all the functions of the monitor on the desktop. So while you can use that joystick on the back to control settings, you can also do everything through the app without having to navigate monitor menus, and it's all here. All your device settings on one, page and all your display options on the other. Very nice. For gaming functions, you have crosshairs, FPS display, adaptive sync or variable refresh rate, which is G-Sync here specifically. You get black equalizer to brighten up some of the darker areas of a map for competitive, and you've got a response time selector. This is called different things on different monitors, but it's like overdrive mode. Instinct would tell you to just set this to the fastest option, but I have yet to meet the monitor where that's the move. The fastest mode almost always comes with some visual trade-offs in order to achieve that one millisecond grade to grade response time that manufacturers love of putting in the marketing, and it's no different here. On every monitor I've ever used, the best practice here is to just set this at the midpoint if you're going to be doing high refresh gaming. Turning it off usually results in ghosting, and setting it too high results in overshoot, and you obviously don't want either of those things. Every 4K panel I've ever owned is 32 inches. I don't know how many times I've had somebody tell me that 27 inches is too small for 4K, and 32 inches is really the entry point. This is my first 27 inch 4K panel, and I could not disagree with that statement more. The pixels per inch, the pixel density here is insane. If you're having trouble with the text being too small, just set the scaling to 150%. But games and content consumption on this thing looks crazy. I ran a Twitter poll too, and I was pretty surprised at the amount of people still running a 27 inch as their main. Shout out to the 24 and 25 inch competitive crowd too. For a long time now, I felt like 27 inch 1440p was the sweet spot for general gaming productivity and even being able to hang with some competitive gaming. I was a little concerned that even my 3080 was not gonna be able to push this 4K panel to its full 144 frames per second, so I was a little concerned about competitive. With Call of Duty running in 4K, you have to clamp the settings down to medium to be able to get low 100s for FPS, but because the pixel density is so high on this panel, you can drop the game resolution to 1440, and then you can max out the FPS with high settings, and honestly, 
it's not that noticeable. I would not recommend this method as the go-to for every gaming scenario out there, but if you need to squeeze a little FPS out of a competitive setting, this works really well. Apex struggles as well, getting down into the low 70s at 4K in the midst of a firefight at high detail, so you do have some trade-offs there also. In games that are a lighter lift for your system, like Valorant, you can run those wide open at 4K. Despite being branded specifically for PS5, both that console and the Series X easily saw the total capabilities of the panel in terms of resolution, refresh rates, HDR, etc. PS5 setup is even easier as it sets the panel to optimum settings for you automatically. All it asks is that you tweak the HDR settings and you're good to go. My first impression on this monitor is that the colors here really pop. Now, part of that is because it's an IPS panel and part of that is because the saturation is really pushed if you're running in SDR mode. It's because this panel has 95% coverage of the DCI-P3 color space and there's no sRGB mode here available if you're running SDR content on your Windows desktop. Out of the box, it leans very blue or very cold and it's very saturated. So if you're a stickler for super realistic colors in SDR mode in Windows, this may rub you the wrong way, but it looks absolutely amazing in games. You basically get two game modes where you have full control, then you have cinema mode, FPS game mode, and a standard mode, which lowers that white balance and that backs off some of that blue tint, but it locks you out of some of the picture controls. Nonetheless, for most users using this for gaming, content consumption, entertainment, you're going to find a setting in here that looks great. If you really want to dial it in, in either of the custom game modes, you also have the ability to set your color temp using custom RGB sliders. One thing here that's major annoying to me is that if you have HDR on, you can't go in and change your picture mode. You have to deactivate HDR first, change your picture mode, and then turn it back on. The same holds true on the console side, but it's much less annoying here as the PS5 will auto-select the mode that works best for whatever you're playing or watching, Love that. As for HDR performance, this is where we get into some really interesting stuff here. I love HDR in the console TV space, but it's largely been throwaway for me on the PC side because every panel I've had has been HDR 400 or 400 nits peak brightness. For some context, a thousand nits peak brightness is what you're normally looking for in a high-end consumer television. Some of the mini LED panels can go as high as 2000 now. So 400 nits peak or HDR 400 on the PC monitor side is not a good or even adequate HDR experience. You can, of course, get monitors that support some HDR 1000 or 1400 or 2000, but man, are you going to pay for it? So we understand the top of the price spectrum. We're talking about panels that range from 1300 up to $3,000. So here we have HD 600 at a $900 price point. That's a good start. But the big thing that Sony brings to the table here is the 96 zone local area dimming. This allows the panel to control which areas of the panel are lit to provide the best contrast between light and dark portions of the image. The lowest tier HD 400 monitors don't include any kind of dimming at all. The next step up from that is edge lit dimming. This is where it lights in vertical bars from top and bottom. It's not a great effect if you can see the difference in brightness of different vertical bars across your screen. Most only have eight bars. Some higher end panels have 16. The M9 takes 12 of those bars vertically and then gives you eight horizontal sections for each bar. Again, for context, 96 is a pretty low zone count for full local area dimming. Higher end monitors like the Asus ROG PG32 UQX give you 1152 zones. The Samsung Odyssey G8 gives you 1196 zones. And some panels like the Alienware QD OLED give you per pixel dimming instead of being limited to zones. But again, those same eye-watering price points. So now we know the top end of price and performance in the market. To get a sense of the lower end of panels offering edge lit dimming, we can look at the Samsung Odyssey G7 that has eight zones at around $800. The closest competitor to the M9 is probably the LG 27 GP950 with 16 zones, and it was priced at $899, though a recent price drop, probably not a coincidence, brings it to $700. With both of them priced equally, the M9 had it clear, but asking $200 over the LG makes things a little more interesting. They share mostly the same specs, but the LG can be overclocked to 160 FPS, and it has slightly better color coverage of the DCI-P3 space. So essentially, you're paying that extra extra $200 to have 96 zone full area local dimming versus that 16 bar edge lit dimming. I don't have an edge lit panel in-house currently, but you can see the different zones lighting versus on my LG OLED where it's pixel by pixel. Based on that, I would imagine the edge lit experience to be pretty distracting. I also thought it was weird that I can't have dimming active exclusively in HDR mode. If it's on, then it's on for both SDR and HDR and you have to turn it on and off manually. If you consume a lot of HDR content on your monitor, you game in HDR on PC or console, which provides some great HDR implementation in game, this 96 zone config may be worth it. And that's really what makes this panel interesting to me. It's definitely aimed at someone who's going to use a single panel to do both PC and console gaming. If your PC exclusive and HDR is just
just not a big deal to you, you can save a lot of money by going with something like the Gigabyte M28U at $499. If you're playing strictly competitive, you really shouldn't even be looking at a monitor in this class. You should be looking at a 24 or 25 inch 1080p panel with higher refresh like 240 or 360 and probably something with backlight strobing like Dyac. That's a big potential gotcha point for competitive players on this monitor. There is no backlight strobing here at all. So you really have to decide how and what you play to make the call here. If you are someone that puts a high premium on HDR and console gaming alongside the PC, especially if you want that PS5 design language and easy compatibility, the M9 is a win. The only reason this isn't an overwhelming recommendation here today is because of the price cut on the LG. Had this review come out before LG did that, it would have been a very enthusiastic recommendation. I feel like Sony definitely did something here if LG felt the need to respond. Talking about this stuff, it's easy to get bogged down in specs and features, so if I haven't explicitly said it, I love the way this panel looks for content, any content really, except for maybe just watching basic YouTube where the saturation may be a bit exaggerated. But for gaming in SDR or HDR, and especially for watching Ultra HD Blu-rays off the PS5, it looks sick, flat out. Love the aesthetic and the feature set, love having my first HDR monitor experience that actually makes HDR content worth it. Not crazy about a couple of the little software setting limitations, Love the look of the stand and the small desk footprint, but I'm not crazy about the lack of ergonomic features and the overcrowded cable management. Despite those minimal shortfalls, for a solid 4K gaming panel under $1,000, it's easy to make a case for the M9. And if you need to make a case for your PC, the Meshify Lite from Fractal Design features the same iconic angular mesh design and great airflow from the Meshify 2, but at a much more affordable price point. You get the same large interior that supports 360 millimeter radiators up top, 360 in the front, and 280 in the basement, and it includes two HDD SSD trays and two dedicated SSD trays for mounting a total of four drives. Plus you get three 140 millimeter fans included and toolless top latching tempered glass. It supports motherboards up to 285 millimeter EATX and easily fits the largest graphics cards on the market. It lacks the modular converting interior of the Meshify 2, so you're not gonna be using this as a big data server, but it is nice that you're not paying for a big feature that you might not even use. Front IO is USB-C ready with an optional add-on. Of course it has all the smart design and great cable routing that Fractal is known for. It has filter everywhere for all that airflow and it's an absolute breeze to build in. If you want to get your hands on one for yourself, click the link in the description. Big thanks to Fractal Design for sponsoring today's video and thank you so much for your time. I would look for this to hit stock around the 11th of August. Hit me in the comments if you have any specific questions. That's it for today and I will catch you all in the next one. Stay up.